title today's sermon is This Sinner Seeking God. I invite you to hear these words from Luke's Gospel, beginning with the uh, 15th chapter and the first verse. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we can rest easy because a hardened criminal is off the streets. I remember reading about a 32-year-old man named Joby Poole who was arrested and sentenced to jail for the theft and robbery of 200,000 Cadbury cream eggs in the UK. This amounted to about $40,000 in candy eggs. Now, allow me to state the obvious, that's a lot of Cadbury eggs. I don't know if you like Cadbury eggs, but this guy must have been a big fan. He must have been all in on Cadbury eggs. He broke into this industrial facility, and he was caught when his getaway ride, a tractor large enough to carry all of those eggs, was not fast enough to escape the police who were behind him. Well, maybe he should have planned for a quicker getaway vehicle, I don't know. The police later joked in a tweet to the community that all was safe after this extravagant theft. I didn't say it was a good joke, but it was a joke. In the uh, New Testament, we find that Jesus wants to be around sinners, criminals, outcasts, rogues, Cadbury egg thieves. I bet Jesus would have wanted to hear this guy's story, don't you think? So, when did you have your first Cadbury egg, he would ask. And the man would say, nobody's ever asked me that before. You see, it all started when I was a kid. That's when I started to love them. And not only does Jesus want to be around sinners, they also want to be around Jesus. When Jesus is around, sinners show up. There is just something about Jesus that attracts those who were normally not attracted to God. The non-church people, if you will. Something about his life, something about his words, something about his actions. Sinners who were shunned by the religious people of the day wanted to be near Jesus. I wonder why that was. Maybe it was because they didn't see much of God in the religious people of that day. But something in Jesus, something about Jesus made them come alive. Made them feel joy, made them feel accepted by God. In our text, we find a group of tax collectors and sinners... Uh, Not the group who would usually hang around a Jewish rabbi. These were like the ultimate losers of the day. The tax collectors were hated by everybody. The sinners were rejected by all of the good Jewish folks. But when the Pharisees see Jesus eating with and welcoming this group of sinners, they are irate. And they start to grumble. Do you all know any grumblers in your life? The ones who are never satisfied with anything. The ones who can never be, be pleased regardless of the situation. I've met some people in my life who I think are professional grumblers, not professional gamblers, professional grumblers. And uh, trust me, it was not a good look for those people. These Pharisees are grumbling, they're murmuring, they're gossiping. Hey, Steve, this is Jack. You're not going to believe who Jesus is hanging out with. Yeah, he's hanging around with those sinners. He's hanging around with those people. Pass the word around. I'll get back to you later. Sinners, tax collectors around Jesus. For Jesus, eating with these people was, in a very real way, declaring that they were acceptable, that the kingdom of God was open to people like them. 
And it's ironic that this accusation they throw out, this accusation that is meant to sting and to wound, it turns into a beautiful declaration of good news. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. I wonder if Jesus heard that and said, well, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Where's the bad part in that? When you're a sinner, this must have sounded like wonderful news, right? To experience somebody like Jesus, to to, to hear his words, to hear his good news. He did not find you reprehensible. Here was somebody saying that God wants to be a part of your life. You can see why sinners were attracted to Jesus. On the other hand, when you believe that you're not a sinner, when you believe that you're better than everybody else, then Jesus' actions and words started to look a little like blasphemy. So we see here that not only does Jesus attract the sinners, he also attracts the religious establishment. Everybody wanted to hear what this guy had to say. Everybody wanted to be around Jesus. And one of the reasons was his teachings. And one of the things we find in his teachings are parables. He tells these little, little stories that we all know and are so familiar with. And parables are interesting because we always try to place ourselves in the story. We try to make ourselves the main character of the story when the truth is that the parables are not so much about us. The parables are about the kingdom of God and God's reign in the world. Jesus says, everybody gather around. I got a story for you. Picture yourself as a shepherd in the fields. Which one of you, if you had 100 sheep and you lost one, would not leave the 99 and go searching for the lost one until you find it. This is exactly what a good shepherd would have done for his lost sheep. And then when you find it, you lay it on your shoulders and go home rejoicing. And when you get there, you call up all your friends and your family and you throw a party. Y'all rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. The implication being here that every shepherd worth their pay would go and search for that lost sheep and bring them back home. That was their job. And uh, did you know that sheep are not known as the brightest of creatures? Uh, Sheep can be kind of dumb, honestly. Uh, They would often put their head down, start eating grass, and they would walk right off the edge of a cliff if the shepherd wasn't there to get a hold of them and protect them. And you know what? I honestly would do the same. If somebody put a bunch of Dairy Queen down in front of me, I would just walk along the way, eat it, and I'll go right off the side. Jesus tells his audience here that God is just like that shepherd who comes to the rescue. There is more joy in partying in heaven when one sinner repents, he says, as opposed to having 99 religious do-gooders who think they don't need repentance. Do you think that caused a stir in the audience when he said that? The sinners, they had to feel hope. Who does this guy think he is? And he makes God seem so appealing. The religious people had to feel anger. Who does this guy think he is? It makes God sound like that. Jesus continues a story about a poor woman who has ten silver coins, loses one of them, lights a lamp, overturns the house, searching carefully until she finds the coin. And then when she finds it, she rejoices. She calls her friends and neighbors, and she has a party with them. This poor woman has so little to her name, so you can understand why she would go searching for one lost coin and then rejoice when she finds it. And Jesus says to the crowds, he says, let me tell you, just like that, there is joy in heaven over one sinner who comes back home. And the picture that Jesus paints of God here is an astonishing picture. God is like the shepherd who searches for the lost sheep. God is like the widow who overturns her house looking for that lost coin. God absolutely rejoices when the missing are found. Let me ask you, is that really what God is like? I mean, most of us have images of God where God is like somewhere out there. He's distant, he's aloof, he's not really concerned about us or for this world. But these stories that Jesus offers us are so different. God seems so lifelike, so personal, so involved. Jesus says that God is a God who searches for his lost children like a shepherd after his lost sheep. And notice that a sheep does not warrant anything that, to, to be saved. The, the, the sheep does not start off back home and then the shepherd realizes it and go and finds them. No, the sheep, he doesn't even know that he's lost. He's just out there eating and having a good time. He doesn't know where anybody is. The shepherd goes and searches for him. It is all about the shepherd's desire. 
Jesus says that God is a God like that. God searches for his lost children like the poor widow searches for that precious coin. A coin doesn't do anything to be found. The coin just sits there. But it's all about that woman's desire to go and search for that coin because it is precious to her. I remember seeing a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon where it was time for the child Calvin's bath. It was bath time. His mother figures out that because it's bath time, Calvin is nowhere to be found. And uh, he's hiding somewhere in the house. He's trying to avoid bath time. She starts going through the house room by room, yelling for him. She says, let's just get this over with right now. It's time for bath time. Seems like that was a regular ritual in their house, Calvin hiding during bath time. She can't find him. She looks in the garage. She looks in the basement. And the last panel shows Calvin laying fully down in the bathtub where nobody can see him, fully clothed, smiling ear from ear. He's very pleased with himself. And he has a thought bubble going over his head, and he's thinking, she'll never find me in here. (laughs) Well, I'm sure mom will eventually find him. She'll eventually come and get him. I thought about how we go off hiding from God like that. And when we go off hiding from God, we quickly find that it's not a game. We know that we're lost, and we know that we have no way of getting back to where we need to be. What Jesus teaches us here is that we have a God who comes searching for us. We have a God who comes to seek us out. He does not leave us in the dark. He does not write us off as a lost cause. One of the essentials to take away from this story is that there seems to be a whole lot of partying going on when lost sinners come home. There seems to be a lot of joy in heaven when sinners return to God. There seems to be so much love and joy and excitement when lost children repent. I love that image of God, don't you? partying, celebrating, rejoicing when his children come back home. If we somehow have it in our minds that God is not too concerned with us, Jesus begs to differ. If we somehow have it in our thinking that God doesn't really care about us, he doesn't really care about our world, Jesus says, no, you've got it all wrong. God is involved, God is personal, God is on the move. And mind you, we have not done anything to warrant our own saving. Like that not very bright sheep, like that lifeless coin that just sits there, we're lost. We forget that sometimes. Sometimes we think that we're pretty good people and that we deserve to be rescued, we deserve to be saved. We think to ourselves, well, why wouldn't God want me on his team? Why wouldn't God come searching for me? I am such a beautiful person. Well, we were dead in our sins is the truth. We were lost in our trespasses, just as lifeless as that coin, just as useless and senseless as that sheep. But this text is not about our worthiness. It's about the God who comes searching for us even before we know we're lost. The God who comes searching for us precisely because we're lost. Yes, we have to repent. Yes, we have to turn to God. But these parables are not primarily about what we do. They're about God and the great lengths that God goes to to bring us home. God takes the initiative, not because we were lovely, not because we were worthy, but because he created us, because he loves us, and because he wants us to come home. God comes searching. God comes turning the house over, probing every nook and cranny. Reminds me, if you ever lost your keys before, when that feeling happens, what do you start doing? You're frantic. You're tossing couch cushions up in the air. You're looking under the bed. You go to your last resort. You look in the refrigerator to make sure they're not in there. How does it feel when you find those keys? Yes. Yes, I found my car keys. Now I can go. Now we can move on. Get this. When we allow ourselves to be found by God, when God takes us on his shoulders and carries us home, Jesus says that parties break out in heaven. All of the heavenly realm rejoices because a sinner has come back home. In fact, Jesus says there's more joy in heaven over that one sinner repenting than over the 99 righteous folks who think they don't need anything. So this morning, if you're wondering to yourself, does God really love me? Does God really care about me? Would God even take me back if I wanted to come home? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. I invite you today to... 
allow yourself to be found by the God who's searching for you. Allow yourself to be found for the God who is overturning the house in search of you. And when we do this, Jesus promises that not only will God love us, not only will God take us back, but there will be a throwdown in heaven, a party on our behalf. And that naturally leads to Jesus' message to the Pharisees. He wants to talk to them too, and I believe he wants to talk to us this morning. Jesus is saying to them and to us, he's saying, hey, if this is what God is like, if this is how God is, then it's time to start imitating God and his passion for reaching lost people and God's ceaseless joy when they come home. You see, the Pharisees were very good at keeping people away from God. They were very good at excluding other people from God when they didn't measure up. And they were often more full of joy at being able to keep somebody away from God than they were about somebody coming back home to God. Doesn't that seem to be the opposite of how things should be? Don't we have that same kind of tendency in the church too? Don't we have that same kind of tendency to to keep others out rather than reaching out in love and witness? Jesus here is seeking to contrast the sinner seeking God with how the religious elite were uh, living. They didn't want anybody new to come to God. They were too busy with their grumbling and their frowns and their arms crossed. You ever see anybody with their arms crossed? I've seen some people, I feel like they were born with their arms crossed, and they haven't uncrossed them since then. They were not interested in bringing the lost sheep back to God. People who were not of their liking, people who were not presentable in their lives, people who were not decent, they didn't want to evangelize, they didn't want to invite new people to God. Jack, what's the remedy? How do we avoid that? How do we avoid becoming like that? Well, the main thing is that we get on board with God's great adventure of seeking out the lost. We take on God's attitude towards the sinners of this world. We open our hearts and our lives and our church to those who are looking for something more, who are looking for life, who are grasping for meaning. We search. We seek. We look for those who are lost so that we can invite them all to God. We join Jesus in showing the world what God is really like. That God is so full of love that he goes about searching for his children and then beautifully welcoming them home. Now, i got to warn you, this will not necessarily amount to an easy way of life. Following Jesus in this way might get a little messy. We might get our hands dirty. Here's a secret. It's a whole lot easier to keep people at arm's length. It's easy to not invite other people to God. It's easy to exclude others and to keep to our own. It's easy to turn inwards and not worry about what's out there in the world or who's out there in the world. But, I don't know if you know this, out there in the world is where the people are. Out there in the world is where the sinners are. And we have the wonderful opportunity to show them the beauty and the grace and the marvelous majesty of God. I fear that if we are not as interested in sinners as God is, then maybe we don't know God very well. I fear that if we're not as excited as God is when sinners come back home, then maybe we don't really know the God of Jesus. If we're not as passionate about searching the lost and reaching out to the lost and celebrating when they're found, then maybe we need to rethink why we're really here. Are we going to join God in the search? Are we going to join in the celebration? Are we going to join in the partying? If we do, I know what people are going to say about us. Hey, have you seen what's going on there at Hawkinsville First United Methodist Church? They're celebrating with those people. They're hanging out with those people. They're talking about those people and talking with those people. And we'll wear that remark like a badge of courage. And we'll say, yeah, you bet we do. Because that's what God did with us. He searches. He seeks. He welcomes. He rejoices. He celebrates. And all of heaven parties with him.
Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who comes searching for us, who comes to seek us when we were lost. Lord, as we allow ourselves to be found this morning, we want to be loved by you, we want to be transformed by you, and then we want to be those who go and seek the lost too. We want to be those who go and search for the lost so that we may bring them back into the fold, so that we may bring them back to your love, your grace, and your transformation. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.